Um, well, I, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your presentations and invite our climate scientists uh, um, back up to the table and uh, uh, see if there are any members of the public who would like to add comments and then we can ask questions. And with our remaining time, which unfortunately is only about 10 minutes, uh, uh, continue to engage in uh, uh, this discussion as more of a dialogue. So members, <laughs> folks uh, who are here who have comments or questions, please come forward. I'm not sure which microphone we're using, but we're going to, yeah, there you go. Hi, uh, Erica Morehouse with Environmental Defense Fund, and I just want to thank everyone um, for the great uh, panel and for the um, great organization of this hearing. Um, I had just um, one comment and then one question. Um, so I think um, particularly listening to, to Dr. Greenblatt's presentation, um, what struck me through it was um, how important the effort that we're engaging in this year is to set uh, long-term climate targets both for 2030 and for 2050 and how those really create an overarching and a unifying framework to bring together all of these really diverse policies that we're also using to achieve those goals, but how the, the climate targets actually give us one baseline by which we can really measure the progress that we're making and making sure that all of the pieces um, add up together. Um, and the, the question that I wanted to ask was um, clarifying over around the policies that were included. And I think my understanding is that, that cap and trade is not included in the model because of how the model is constructed. Um, and I wanted to ask how, um, you know, that being true, how that actually um, provides some opportunity around uh, cap and trade filling some of the policy gaps as well as um, promoting some of the technology gaps um, and incentivizing technology innovation and ad adaptation that we do need to get to that, that last 2050 goal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Morehouse. Um, yes, I think I'll uh, first answering the question of the value of uh, setting longer term goals such as 2030 and beyond. Uh, it's my personal opinion that I think they're extremely important because it seems that having a goal, a statewide climate goal, um, then motivates uh, the suite of policies that we've been seeing, uh, you know, instituted for the state that, that is definitely taking us toward that goal. And although I don't think when all of those policies were initially established, it was clear exactly how much the greenhouse gas savings would, would be over the intervening decades. It's, it's evident that they are all complementary and that they push you down the road and that if you have a 2030 goal, there will be policies that uh, at least speak to reductions through 2030. If you have a 2040 goal, then there's a natural tendency for those policies to look at least that far into the future. And the more ambitious you set uh, these interim goals, then the, the harder each of the complementary sector-specific policies will have to reach in order to sort of do their part toward lowering the overall climate. So I think uh, if, if, <clears throat> even if only psychologically they play a very important role, but obviously having a legally binding target will, will definitely help us to, to meet the ambitious targets we need to get to by 2050. Um, regarding cap and trade, uh, you're absolutely right. The way the model was set up, um, it was not uh, uh, easy for us to implement that in the version that, uh, that, that I talked about. However, uh, as you rightly pointed out, um, it can play a role in sort of complementing whatever, whatever target uh, greenhouse gas gap may exist. As you noticed in the 2020 targets, it's looking like cap and trade may not need to play a very significant role because with the complementary policies alone, we will probably get below that target. But in future years, it may play a very important role in closing whatever policy uh, gap may exist vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the chosen greenhouse gas target. And uh, while I'm not sure that it could do such a heavy lift to be able to bring us down, uh, you know, by another 50% in 2050, uh, it does have the power to uh, economically find the right combination of uh, technologies and strategies that can get us the rest of the way there when a, uh, a technical pathway is not obvious. And since I see such a long line, I will cede yes. to whoever the next questioner is. Sure. Thank, thank you. And we're going to have to uh, keep both the uh, comments, questions, and responses as brief as possible. Unfortunately, we only have a limited time. Thank you, Chairman Bloom. Paul Mason with Pacific Forest Trust. And mine's really more of a comment, so it shouldn't engender much of a response. And I wanted to sort of tear off of something <coughs> Ms. Pessero um, 
said about the value of natural lands and really looking at them in terms of we have this principle sort of like it's in our bank account and that continues to grow over time. And so one of the sort of side effects of that is that in actions that we take now to cause that principle to grow, actions that you know, start to shift our forests towards holding more carbon or restoring our wetlands, that will put us on a trajectory to be increasing the contribution that natural lands are making over time. And so those relatively, those very cost effective, cost effective actions that we're taking now, when we start looking out towards 20, 30, 40, and 50, when it's going to become increasingly more difficult and more expensive to be wringing the last carbon out of our economy to get down to our targets, those actions that we took in 2016 that put us on a trajectory to be vastly increasing the carbon in our forests, wetlands, rangelands, other places, are going to seem really smart and really cost effective. So I just want to really put a fine point there that there's no substitute for time when it comes to increasing sequestration in natural systems. Thank you. John, Hop John Hopkins, California Habitat Conservation Planning Coalition. Just very briefly, in looking at the, f we need to be looking at the full role of natural, full suite of natural lands, as Michelle said. Um, for example, even um, Southern California chaparral that burns periodically is turning out to be a carbon sink. Um, and then we need to think a lot about soil carbon. We, we've underestimated the role of soil carbon uh, in s maintaining uh, already sequestered carbon and sequestering more carbon. Um, and then thirdly, we need to value and integrate existing programs. Examples, the Wildlife Conservation Board's Oak Woodlands program and rangeland and grassland program that would help some of the case studies that Michelle talked about. Um, our county scale uh, regional conservation plants will be protecting an additional 215,000 acres over and above mitigation. People focus on mitigation when they hear conservation plans. But, or, and this will not only help with more carbon sequestration, it will also help um, with land use management, curbing sprawl, uh, getting more sustainable communities. Thank you, Chairman Bloom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Will Barrett. I'm with the American Lung Association in California. <laughs> I first want to thank you for holding this uh, great discussion today. This is actually National Public Health Week, and yesterday President Obama and the Surgeon General made climate change at the forefront of all the messaging they did because of the, uh, the significant health impacts that climate change is having and will continue to have without strong leadership. We believe California's leadership is really leading the way on reducing air pollution and fighting climate change. And we think that, uh, along with many of our public health colleagues, that this is really critical to protecting public health, especially in our most disadvantaged communities, as, as Strella Service noted. Um, our research at the Lung Association, we found that AB32 programs are, are really <coughs> working and really reducing the um, air pollution and respiratory health impacts of air pollution as they cut carbon pollution. Uh, the low carbon fuel standard and the cap and trade program for fuels uh, we found that by 2025 that these programs together will cut about $8 billion worth of health damages. That's uh, thousands and thousands of asthma attacks avoided because we're cleaning up our fuels. Similarly, uh, we did a report last year on um, the San Joaquin Valley implementing SB 375 smart growth strategies and found that uh, there, throughout the valley, more walkable communities could really um, reduce the, the health damages by about $400 million a year over uh, you know, current sprawl-oriented sprawl growth. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of say that I appreciated Dr. Green, uh, Greenblatt for noting that we need to move our climate and, and criteria air pollution policies together really to maximize both at the same time. California's made tremendous progress, but we still have about 70 percent or more of our population living in counties with unhealthy air. So we know we need to do more. Uh, we know we need to be, you know, celebrate the success we've had, but we also need to invest more in the, the clean technology we need to reduce air pollution and climate change, but also in the smart growth st uh, strategies and natural resources strategies that we heard about today. We, we strongly support all of the um, investment discussion that Strella brought up in, in the 535 quad uh, recommendations and just wanted to, again, thank you and look forward to working with you to protect the public health and air quality in California as we fight climate change and continue to lead the fight. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have more of a comment than um, a question. I'm Olivia Hara with Civic Spark, AmeriCorps Civic Spark, which is an amazing uh, program that Governor, oh, sorry, which is an amazing program uh, 
initiated by Governor Brown to provide on the ground support in implementing climate change and uh, climate adaptation and protection measures across the state. And I'm currently embedded at Sierra Business Council, which is a nonprofit that fosters thriving communities in the Sierra Nevada through um, projects that develop and amplify uh, the region's social, economic, and environmental capital. And I'm working with, on one of these projects is Sierra Camp, which is the Sierra Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Partnership, which uh, is a collaborative effort designed to support and catalyze already existing mitigation efforts in the Sierra region. Um, I'm here today to just ask the state to continue to support and assist these programs, um, to recognize the importance of our work and to understand that without these programs, the policies created and bills passed would mean nothing and be nothing without programs like Civic Spark and Sierra Camp to implement them on a local level. Um, they're imperative to our state's success in climate adaptation and mitigation efforts, and, uh, <laughs> and they are what turns discussion into action and what turns, uh, transforms policy into reality, and they're vital to not only our state, but to the world, because we're part of a bigger picture, and uh, just hope that you'll continue to support them and assist them. Thank you for your time and attention. Good afternoon, Jeannie Wardwaller with the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. I just want to thank you for the discussion today and looking at this issue from a very big picture. Um, I also want to support um, the, the three last panelists and the recommendations they gave you. We're also part of the Sustainable Communities for All coalition that Stuart mentioned and um, have been working with that group and look forward to working with you further. Um, I just had one clarifying question. Dr. Gleenbach, uh, sorry, <laughs> you mentioned the... Um, VMT reduction strategies as something that you modeled. And I just wanted a little bit more information briefly, I know, but about whether that, you know, kind of the extent of how that includes things like behavior change to walking and biking and, and those sorts of strategies. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Uh, very briefly, we adopted a U.S. PERG scenario that incorporated a number of those strategies kind of together and for the U.S. overall and downscaled it for California. Uh, we would very much like to model a set of initiatives that are specific to California and that have uh, specific call-outs for increased walking, biking, you know, uh, dense urban planning, but that's not in the model right now. It's a, it's a hole that we'd like to fill. Hello, my name is Lisa Hershey. I'm here on behalf of Housing California and the Sustainable Communities for All Coalition. I, too, would like to thank you for holding this really important conversation, pulling out again to look at the big vision for California and exploring the problem and then looking at specific strategies. I'd like to echo all three of your panelists this afternoon in terms of the strategies because we support everything that they spoke to. We are in alliance with 535 and the investments in the disadvantaged communities as well. So thank you for this conversation and we look forward to more opportunities to explore solutions together. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the dais? Mr. Stone? Just a, just a brief comment. We've seen the big picture and then the implementation that's there. And I think there's long been a disconnect in environmental policy at the state level with the, the, the goals and yet the impacts. Because if we're looking at whether it's pollution, climate change, those impacts have long been felt in our underserved communities across California. So the, the place we need to look to first for implementation is really in those communities. And that's uh, the, your comments about distributed generation, about focusing on transportation, transportation fuels, I think have much greater significance when we're looking at where we're implementing and, and some of the details in, in how we're implementing. So I, I think this was a very good conversation today to start broad and then look at the potential for mitigating impacts and, and building that resiliency in California with the communities that have been affected the most. Well, thank you uh, once again. Thank you for everybody who attended. I know uh, this also uh, um, was uh, broadcast today, this, this hearing, so hopefully there were a lot of people listening in. This has been a very important, engaging 
conversation. We will continue it. I hope we'll come back next year and, 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 and do the same thing. But it's uh, uh, been very informative to uh, me and I'm sure to all of my colleagues and will help us in our deliberations on this uh, extremely critical issue as we move forward. Thank you, and we're adjourned. <laughs>